Hello and welcome to Mud School TV. Today we're here at Nuclear Races, who you voted to be the best obstacle race in the UK at last year's Mud School Awards. It came as no surprise that Nuclear walked away with four Mudstall Awards again last year. They really are at the forefront of obstacle racing in the UK. Not only have they got a permanent site with a lot of land and great consistency of mud, their obstacles really are at the cutting edge of obstacle racing. If there's a new obstacle causing a scene anywhere in the world, you can be pretty sure that Nuclear are going to be the first ones to build it in the UK. But not only that, they're filled with their own great ideas and they're really pushing the boundaries. Nuclear Races is hosted in the farmland of their founder, Mr James Parrish. Not only is he filled with ideas, he has so much passion and so much drive to do more with our community and with our industry. We're going to try and catch up with him, try and find a little bit more about the secret of Nuclear Races' success and also how they plan to keep on growing and keep on getting better which, by the standard of their races, that's going to be a tough thing to do. I can't hear your voice, do I have a choice? Well, welcome to Mud School TV, James. <laughs> I think this is the first time I've been in a tractor, it's very exciting. I guess this is how it all started, um, right? You had, you've got a farming background, and your father was a farmer, your father before that was a farmer. Um, how many generations does it go back? Oh, we've counted at least five generations, if not more. Cool, so um, what, what kind of farming do you do here? So it's a, it's a 2,000 acre estate. We're predominantly arable, but like all farmers, certainly in this part of the country, we, we look to diversify. We, we invest where we can, and that's led to us having things like secret nuclear bunkers, having rope runners, having motorcycle trials courses, having fish and chip shop, having shops. Uh, nuclear races is obviously one now, and so the list goes on. And what's your favorite of all those businesses? Oh, I now consider myself an RD. <laughs> I love, I love this. I love the community. I love the, um, I love the design of the obstacles, the thinking of the obstacles, uh, seeing them actually then build. And, uh, and what you might have as a farmer um, that other event directors doesn't have, don't have is the is the machinery that comes from having a farmer. You've got plenty of tractors, and I've heard about how you use irrigation and also machinery to improve the course itself. So yes, big boys toys really is what you're saying. Uh, yes, we love a tractor, we love an excavator, we love a bulldozer. We have all these on the farm. Now we don't use those all the time, but there are cases when you know the bulldozer is very handy. We need to clear brambles nobody nobody likes getting scratched on race day so that's the ideal tool for that the excavator well we use that almost every day when we're building so yes we rely ever so heavily on those and we it wouldn't be the course it is without that infrastructure behind the scenes um, obviously we love mud here but it's hard to manipulate the weather and we do have to make the mud sometimes or enhance it shall we say so again yes irrigation pumps which we would have used uh, in the past for irrigating potatoes or a flower crop or something like that, we uh, are, are, are reused for that purpose. And if it's dry before a race, then it will be, we will spend up to a week moving water around behind the scenes, creating mud pits, just making it just right for the day. But actually, I think the most attention that you've got over the last year or so has been the obstacles, not just the, the, the quality of those obstacles, but also the quantity. How do you come up with the ideas for it? And, and how do you get all these things built and, and around the course? Bottom line is I love building obstacles and um, that's, a, that's a great job. I find it really rewarding, very stimulating to, to, to think of an obstacle, uh, modify it, then build it, and then see people going over it. Very satisfying. So, Typically, especially this time of year when it's a bit quiet, uh, people will offer me advice. You'll see pictures, you may be at the local um, ch children's playground and something will just click in your brain. And you think, well, that'll be a good idea. And you mull it over in the office with the rest of the team and then it gets modified. We go into the workshop. Uh, we've normally got most things to hand so we can then mock it up, do a prototype. You know, at the moment we're actually doing exactly that and we'll see how it performs. Um, not everything makes it through by a long way and certainly it's 
an evolution. It, the process isn't set. You know, as we're building it, we come up with enhancements, and to even the extent that we'll produce an obstacle and we'll know that yes, that's that's what we're going to do this year. But next year, we're going to add another stage to it and another stage when we come to it. Because we have got to the stage now, we're on the course. It's, it's typically a 12-kilometer course, and we'll have 100 plus obstacles. So actually, we're getting to the stage where we've got too many obstacles. We can we can pick and choose. And I think the answer for the future is we will be um, enhancing some of them, ditching others, bringing in new ones. But perhaps we'll be having more importantly, sort of obstacle zones, areas. We are able to move the obstacles around. They're big obstacles. You couldn't uh, flat pack them or put them on a trailer and move them. But we, we're lucky on the farm. We do have telehandlers. We have two of them. So we move the course around. In fact, we've never yet done the same course. Uh, you talk about obstacle areas there. One of them that really stands out to me is the aquaphobia area. Um, uh, how did that come about? Originally, it was a part of the farm that we used as an irrigation reservoir. Uh, many years ago, we used to grow herbs, typically mint. We used to make mint sauce, believe it or not. We used to, in fact, we used to produce a 400 tonne of mint sauce a year. But that market has died off now, and so we're left with a storage facility, the, the, the lagoon full of water. So it's a matter of making use of your natural resources. Okay, thanks James. Let's go and have a wander around and, uh, and, and see what interesting stuff we can find. Great, let's go. Whereabouts are we here, James? Uh, this is this all looks very exciting. Ah, yes, it is. This is the farm workshop, and this is where all the good fun happens. Um, this time of year, when it's wet outside, behind us we've got a new obstacle. Uh, as, as as often is the case, it uh, we, we have no fixed ideas on how it's going to end up. We start building it, and when then we'll modify it as we go through the build. So the idea with this one, Pete, is it's actually a water obstacle. It's going to be suspended in the water, floated, so you're going to have to come across. Uh, actually, it's just before the zip lines in the lake. I'm sure a lot of you will remember those. You're going to have to climb, muscle up out of the water onto the ladder here, climb up to the top, and then jump off, shuffle off, however you like to get down. We can see a lot of welding uh, going on here which actually when you think about most obstacle races they're built to be moved around um, from from place to place um, I doubt whether most are actually welded together a lot will be bolted together but um, so so this is this is quite different do you think that that's a that's a strength and it makes the obstacles better for it, it, it it's paramount to us we're, we're a permanent course so the obstacles are out there all year round it doesn't take long for even the best wood to deteriorate especially uh, with the amount of numbers that we put over them. So, uh, for, for, from my point of view, yes, we're much better doing it in steel. It's done once, it's done right, it's safe, it's not going to collapse, no issue. We were uh, just saying earlier on that um, the type of bars you use, quite a lot of the time we'll see scaffolding bars um, at obstacle races because it's quite easy to move around and bolt together. Um, and but, but actually scaffolding is quite thick, right? So, um, uh, what... Tell us, tell us a little bit about the kinds of tubing that you use. Okay, so you, you, you hit the nail on the head there. Um, we tend to buy in special um, pipe just like this, which is narrower than an average scaffold pole. I mean, you and I, Pete, we've got big hands. Yes, we can, we can do, a, do, do a scaffold pole, um, especially when we're dry, but it is tough under race conditions. So we would tend to use this 32 mil outside dimension um, steel pipe which is galvanized as well the galvanizing on it also gives it a slight rough uh, texture which again we all know uh, when we're rolling around in the mud is, is beneficial so with every race we try and make things different and, and, and put a twist on things and this particular obstacle is designed to be used both ways in rush in, in May we'll probably go up the ladder first and then jump off the platform into the water. But races after that, this you'll see is like an invert here. So we'll probably reverse it. We'll have to think about uh, flow rates and make sure we don't get any cues, especially in the water. But we'll put a ladder bar across here and so then people will have to climb up uh, vertically, and muscle up over the top and then down the other side. Of course, we might then just add a few special effects and put some flames underneath.
Uh, actually, look, this is Tyler. He's a, a, a new member of the team, um, and one of his jobs is to sort of just look after the course all year round. So at the moment we're doing a bit of maintenance, but this particular obstacle is a very good example how uh, we've had it two or three years now. It was fairly simple uh, before, you may remember it, two polystyrene floats with two pipes on it. Uh, but we can, we can improve that now, so we've made it into a tunnel now. So, um, so we can see where Tyler's standing there. You go under that black corrugated part. So it's a, it's a full submergence underwater, then into a dark tunnel underneath. Yeah, but there's obviously two, three foot of, 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 of breathing space. Obviously there's some uh, more pipes hidden in the dark there for you to mind your head on and uh, out the other side. So you're spending most of your days submerged in the, uh, in the ponds here of nuclear races. It's, uh, yeah, it's a nice day to, <laughs> to go down into the water. A little bit chilly, but fun. And tell us about what you're doing. Uh, currently, I'm just doing a bit of cosmetics on it, we're just painting the top, eventually we're going to have a banner over the top of it as well, we're just trying to make it look a lot nicer than what it is at the moment. Okay, so we're here at the, the Nuclear Races Gorilla Bars, which actually, in the scheme of things, uh, is seeming not old hat, but they've been around for quite a while now. They caused a, a big stir when they when they came along, and uh, it's 120 meters. 120 meters. 120 meters. Yeah, and I think from memory, there's only three people that have actually completed it under race conditions. Yeah, and, and it's crazy that such a such a massive obstacle has actually almost been overshadowed by others, which is, um, I guess, that's just the way you do things. But um, uh, are, you, are you doing anything different with it this year? Well, this is this is quite typical, really. So obviously behind us we have the gorilla bars, but uh, as people are saying, this is getting a little bit old hat now. So we're going to have a twist on it um, and that's the flying monkey bars so the, 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 I'm, I'm sure most of you will know uh, the consequence of falling off the monkey bars the gorilla bars was going into the nuclear trenches and there's about 20 of those behind of us we're thinking now that um, there is a way around those trenches and we've cut every other bar out and so we've got flying monkey bars so if you complete the seven meters of flying monkey bars then you'll be able to bypass the 20 nuclear trenches So obviously, Pete, you recognise uh, this obstacle because you were kind enough to award us best obstacle uh, last year, and, and this is obviously the death slide. Now we've been experimenting with a kicker, and you can see there's two on the far side there. That went down really well at the last race. Uh, people get a lot of time in the air. Uh, in fact, some say there's enough time for a cup of tea while you're up there. But um, we're not happy with that. What we, we think we're going to do now is put kickers over all eight lanes and so we should get some really good photos here for the next race for your Facebook page. Proper childhood dream here. Riding a tractor with James. Doot, doot. <laughs>